allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If I could just have to ask everyone to remain standing for a moment, uh, just just to send our prayers and thoughts to the students um, and the Uber driver who are uh, still in the hospital and um, for their families uh, who are I obviously uh, very concerned about their children and their loved ones. And um, I just wanted to say uh, that the town of Fairfield stands with uh, Sacred Heart University. Those students are our students. Um, they're part of our Fairfield family. And um, I just wanted to have a moment to, of reflection. Board. Thank you. Our first item uh, is may I have a motion um, to hear and consider and act upon a request from the Mill Hill Elementary School Building Committee to disband. No. <laughs> Stuck for life. Where's your little bell? So Come moved. in. You don't have bell sign. <laughs> so moved. Second. Okay. I'm going to open up the board. Would you like to say something to us? <laughs> All right. Well, I got all prepared. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, second school done as chairman, so that's pretty cool. It is really great. So I, I think the building committee worked hard. We were the, during COVID, we got everything done. Relatively quickly, we ordered stuff ahead of time. Thank goodness we didn't have too much uh, inventory issues. Uh, we added four new classrooms, um, 25 additional square foot to the main office, renovation to the existing gymnasium, made the cafeteria larger, uh, added additional boys' and girls' bathrooms, and made all the bathrooms ADA approved. Uh, we put a new sprinkler system in throughout the school, new fire alarm system throughout the school, new ceiling and LED lighting throughout. And more importantly, we have every classroom and every room has HVAC throughout the school. It's great. We are connected. I like that too. Um, the kitchen was expanded also, new freezers were put in, and the construction of OT and PT rooms were done. Um, as of right now, we are going to return to the town approximately $400,000. Once everything is finalized, we're looking a little more, I'm thinking 450, 470, give or take, but definitely 400,000 will come back. It's awesome, Jason. And just to remind everybody, it's it's a, what is the capacity of that school? The capacity of the school, I believe, is 441. 441. It's interesting because with all the discussion about redistricting and needing more space and stuff, um, it's too bad it wasn't built larger. But um, I, run, I just want to thank you uh, very much, the entire committee, for your hard work on this. I know in the school district, um, it's Sal, and I know it was a lot of effort, and there was a lot of twists and turns <laughs> up there at the time with uh, movement and parking and moving things around and then the soil issue. But you really uh, took care of everything very professionally, and I just want to thank you for your time and effort. Really, building committees go unnoticed uh you you do your work quietly you're not on fair tv <laughs> you're, you know you just really put your nose to the grindstone and do the real work of of this um, town and, and it's a benefit to the entire community so thank you very much well that was a good committee to work for um, everyone worked together especially during the covid time it worked out it worked well together that's great thanks thank you jason thank first of all thanks to you and the committee for all the efforts and hard work quick question for you uh, What's left? What's undone as we disband you? Because you just said, hey, some of the fun. Okay. Well, we have just a few outstanding uh, invoices that still haven't come in. We had to wait. Believe it or not, the final part was shelving for the libraries that only came in recently. Uh, they have been installed. We're just waiting for the final bills. So there's just a couple of small bills out there. I don't want to say small. There are a couple of bills out there. Um, but the building is complete. It is. Uh, we haven't, as a building committee, we haven't met in say six months and we were waiting to get on the agenda and we were waiting for those items so and what's uh what about reimbursement to the state has all that been applied for and all that yes. so the final, and final final submission has gone in we were waiting for the audit it's one of the other items that are is outstanding and are you too comfortable that the uh, committee has no more work left based on what they needed to provide to you 
they they've had fulfilled at spec and we're happy with that. Okay. With the building, we're happy. Thank you, Jason. The keys are yours. So <laughs> hi, thank you very much. Um I think people forget that part of functioning of the town is the volunteers that working tirelessly to kind of keep, keep the trains on time and running, et cetera, um, and on track. What happens with those invoices, though? So how do they, if your committee's disbanded, just literally what's the process of? They, they sit in town. Basically, I will stay on in the other chair, and then um, I believe there are two or three outstanding um, that are in the system when to be paid, and once those are paid, I will uh, final sign off it. All right, so no, it's maybe a technicality, but we can vote to disband and still Jason will be authorized to function in his capacity to do that. Or is there like a technical issue? I'm just worried that if we disband you officially, I just want to make sure you're authorized. Oh, we do all this. We took an early vote that the, the chairman and the co-chair were able to approve any invoices that were under 10000 or $20,000 in, in price. I think the last two or three invoices are under $5,000. We're just waiting for it. Basically, it's to pay for the library shelving that came in and install. Yeah, and I think my question is more just a technicality of, of us approving as a body the disbandment, but still you being able to function as a member. So assuming that's like all legit, then obviously I support the disband this disbanding of this committee. But uh... and I and I think we we have to acknowledge the two members that. Uh, that passed during this time, obviously, uh, uh, Harry Ackley, which is a beloved um, member of this community, and my mentor, Tom Quinn, who helped me through the first building job I was on, and honestly taught me nothing because I joined another building committee, another one after that, and uh, <laughs> those their, their passing was definitely uh, felt, so give them a lot of credit, too, for being part of it, and the rest of the committee that picked up all their slack. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Jason. All right, if there's no further comment from the board, is there any comment from the public? Seeing none, back to the board. Just wanted to say thank you oh. to the board. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You're well, off. Thank, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Al. And thank you for your work. We're always on top of it, that's for sure. All right. Do that, we need for, sorry, do we need formal confirmation that he's allowed to function in that way, or is it just that's the way it works? That's, in my experience, that's the way it works. Okay. So back to the board. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Jason. Take care, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, our next item, uh, can I get, um, well, it's not a voting item. Um, uh, this is uh, to hear a presentation from Aquarian Water Company on its value of water campaign. And I believe Carolyn. Hi, Carolyn. Oh, you're Hi, sure. can you hear me all right? Yes. Super. Yes, absolutely. Now let's make sure Thank I can you. share my screen. I'm getting a lot of helpful pop-up messages. Okay. And so we each have a copy we were sent of the PowerPoint as well. Okay, great. And you can, uh, anyone I suppose maybe virtually can hopefully can confirm you can see the screen. Good share. There it is. There it is. All right, super. Thank you for your patience with that. Uh, I'm Carolyn Jaffe. I'm Aquarion's Director of Sustainability and Environmental Management. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm going to present this slide deck. If you notice, there are quite a few slides. Uh, so I'm going to go quite fast, but I'll be happy to answer questions uh, when I'm finished. And there we go. Uh, you may not think about Aquarion very often. Maybe when you turn your tap on and there's water there, more likely only if you have a problem uh, with your water. Uh, but we operate in a very complex environment. Uh, we have a changing regulatory environment uh, every several years. There are new rules, uh, new emerging contaminants. It takes a lot of work to deliver the water from source and protect that source, treat the water, deliver it to customers, and assure the quality of that water throughout that whole delivery process. 
Uh, so it's quite a complex environment, and I hope to give you a little bit better picture of that today. Uh, again, I'm going to go a little bit quickly and uh, be happy to answer questions when I get to the end. So just starting at the beginning, Aquarion is a 166-year-old company founded in Bridgeport. Uh, I'm also, I should have said, I'm not going to read slides to you, so you'll have the notes. Uh, but certainly if there's a bullet point somewhere that you want me to go back to, I'm happy to do that also. Uh, we are in a growth mode. We have acquired many, many water systems in the last 10 or I'll actually go all the way back 20 years ago, we acquired the assets of the Connecticut, uh, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire uh, water companies, uh, and we've been adding systems ever since. Uh, in 2017, we were acquired by Eversource. We are operating at this time still as a wholly owned subsidiary with our own management team, our own customer service team, uh, accounting, all those back office functions are uh, at home, I would say, with Aquarion. And I really think that is part of what enables us to deliver the kind of customer service that we want to deliver. Uh, in the middle of the slide there is P.T. Barnum. It's just a fun fact. People always enjoy that he was our second company president. I was a little disappointed that didn't make it into the greatest showman, but I guess it really <laughs> wasn't, wasn't part of the story arc. So again, uh, we are in Connecticut, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire, and you can see on this slide the uh, relative size of the operating system. So Connecticut, by far, uh, is where our greatest number of customers are. You see the term rate base there. If you're not familiar with that, that is the value of our assets. So all of our treatment plants, dams, uh, wells, offices, water mains installed in Connecticut have a value of a billion dollars. Uh, and then you see Massachusetts, New Hampshire, uh, much, much smaller uh, companies. So again, in Connecticut, 59 different towns. You Again, I won't read to you, but you see the uh, magnitude of the infra infrastructure that we are operating in Connecticut, uh, 10 surface water treatment plants, many, many, many more groundwater treatment systems. Uh, Fairfield, of, of course, is treated surface water uh, is your source of supply, but we have many, many groundwater systems throughout the state as well, and more than 3,000 miles of water main. We are a uh, customer experience company. We talk about the customer experience all the time, internal customers, external customers, uh, and we strive to uh, have those customer interactions that are going to get us that uh, plus one experience uh, for our customers. If anyone ever doubted that's what's measured is managed, if you take a look at that top graph, you are looking at, uh, it's the line graph there, Pura complaints. So complaints about Aquarion that made it to our uh, main regulatory agency, uh, the Public Utilities Regulatory Authority. Uh, so it was in the early 2000s. We had taken over the Connecticut American system. We had grown by about 50%. Uh, and the number of uh, complaints that made it all the way to New Britain that year was 66 and we started a concerted effort and a concerted program with all of our staff uh, talking about the customer experience. You can see we have been in the single digits for many, many uh, years as a result of that program. Uh, we have been a top workplace many, many times. We love our staff and you know, we seek to uh, train and develop our staff. Uh, part of the complex world we live in today uh, is kind of that changing nature of the utility workforce where we used to have a lot of people who were here 20, 30, 40 years. We're not experiencing that anymore. We're experiencing a uh, younger workforce and a workforce where five, seven years is more of a typical um, career. Uh, so we have had to up our game in terms of workforce development to try to attract and keep top talent, but also make sure that new employees have the tools and information that they need to understand what's a very uh, complicated distribution, uh, distribution system. And our employees, by and large, live where we are. 
so we live in our communities. Um, people volunteer in their communities or on their conservation commission, uh, started the uh, farmer's market in their town, coach Little League, all those, all those great things. Um, and Aquarium, I'm glad to say, encourages that. We are environmental stewards. Uh, we manage more than 22,000 acres of watershed forests. That's my department. Uh, I'm very, very proud of our land management and the work that goes into protecting our sources of supply, whether it's the watersheds and reservoirs that serve Fairfield and other uh, parts of the greater Bridgeport system or the wells and aquifer protection areas serving other parts of the state. All of that, of course, is, um, is, is that's necessary in order to drive uh, water quality. Uh, and that's the reason behind it and the root of what we do. Uh, we have our Environmental Champions Program. Hopefully you have heard of that. Uh, we uh, have a carbon neutral initiative. You probably are unaware of that. We haven't done a very good job of advertising that. You won't find it on our website anywhere, unfortunately. Uh, and right now we're actually working on developing a science-based target with a little bit more rigorous effort around reducing our carbon footprint. And we have a comprehensive water conservation program, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. So we have a lot of challenges. As I said, it's a very complex environment. Uh, it's not as easy as turning a valve and the water comes out. Uh, constant uh, changes to water quality regulations, uh, climate change and warmer temperatures actually impact water quality. So we have interesting dynamics there as we look ahead to the future and what we need to do to ensure that drinking water standards are met. Uh, PFAS, hopefully everyone has heard of, is this group of man-made chemicals that's in uh, Teflon and uh, stain repellent and water repellent products in firefighting foams, uh, but has led, unfortunately, to widespread contamination of both groundwater and surface water. So we are awaiting EPA's um, final regulations at this time. They issued a draft, we issued comments, as did many others in the industry, and we are waiting to see where those land, and they will uh, certainly necessitate treatment systems, how many treatment systems and where uh, is what remains to be seen. Uh, there are changes to the lead and copper rule and the way we comply uh, with the lead and copper standards that are part of the safe drinking Water Act, and they will require increased sampling, increased communication with customers, uh, schools, daycares um, that we are gearing up for. Again, this is very complex and it's going to require a lot of communication and messaging. Unfortunately, I'm pretty sure it will also result in some confusion with customers, schools, etc. Um, so hopefully uh, we are up to that challenge. It is uh, a big one. But ultimately, the goal, of course, is to remove all of the lead service lines and eliminate uh, that as a route of entry for lead exposure uh, for our customers. Stream flow regulations are uh, approaching. We are um, maybe, I think, five years away now from where we will have to comply with the stream flow regulations, and we will lose part of what we consider our margin of safety or our safe yield uh, because we will have to release more water downstream is great for the environment and the fisheries and the things that rely on the water in those downstream receiving bodies, but not so great uh, necessarily for our customers because it means we have less water in storage uh, for day-to-day -day human consumptive needs. I mentioned aging workforce already. Uh, customer expectations uh, never get lower. They just get higher and higher. Uh, and climate change, again, we will um, certainly weekends like last weekend affect both water quality and water quantity for us. And we expect uh, to have to respond and be more and more resilient in the years ahead. So we think we're up to the challenge. Uh, we have to understand the big picture uh, and we have to have the right people on the bus. Uh, we have a lot of experience throughout the organization. We still do have this great mix of people uh, I've been at the company for 21 years uh, of people who have been here for a long time and a newer staff, and we are working very hard to leverage that and make sure that we are uh, giving the customer experience, not just complying with rules and regulations, um, but that we're adapting and we're resilient um, and we're ready for what comes in the years ahead. 
So I want to talk about our conservation program a little more specifically. Um, it is uh, something I'm a little more familiar with. There are some other uh, topics. I may not be the right person to answer your question. Hopefully this one I will be able to. Uh, we have a um, conservation program I'm hoping that you're at least familiar with, which is primarily a twice weekly irrigation schedule. Um, it really came on the heels of the drought of 2016, and this is a picture of our barred reservoir in Stanford during that drought. Um, so that was a huge impetus, um, but also decoupling was a huge impetus. So in 2012, which was our prior uh, rate proceeding, um, we had our rates decoupled. So our revenues no longer depend on volumetric sales, and we can have a conservation program and we can mean it. Uh, so that's a good thing because finding new sources of supply and moving water from Fairfield down to Westport and into Stanford, these things are very expensive. Um, and if we don't have to do it or we can do less of it, that's a good thing. It's good for the environment and it keeps costs down. Climate change, of course, uncertainty about water supply in the future uh, means that we should be focusing on conservation. And again, the stream flow regulations, we know we will have less water supply in the future because we will be releasing more water to our downstream environments. So in 2015, coincidentally, we had hired a national conservation expert to do a consumption analysis for us so we could understand where are our opportunities to drive conservation of water. So what we understand from that analysis is that in the winter months, consumption is down and it keeps going down. Uh, appliances keep getting more and more efficient and that's a good thing. So each person is using less water now than they did 10 years ago to do the exact same tasks in the winter months. In the summertime, however, demand is going up and summer is getting longer. We used to say that after Memorial Day, uh, Memorial Day to Labor Day was like the irrigation season. Now we see irrigation seasons on in April all the way through the end of October, unfortunately. So some communities have a really dramatic summertime peak factors. Are we know our customer base is 90% residential. Uh, we know that most of our customers are very efficient. Connecticut uh, customers actually uh, use less water than the national average. But we do have a minority of customers who use excessive amounts of water. And that is demonstrated on this graph. So there's a lot going on here. But the blue part of the bar is indoor water use. And the red part is outdoor water use. And this is um, the most telling example, really. This is what we call Southwest Fairfield County, which is our Greenwich, Stanford, Darien, and New Canaan customers' consumption patterns. So the average of all of the customers is there on the, the left-hand side. And then as you move across, you see the top 1% of customers. So the top 1% of customers are using 7% of the water. And then if you zoom all the way to the right of that graph, you see that the bottom 50% of customers are only using 21% of the water. So it's this really skewed effect that you get from kind of what we call our, our super users. So working with this irrigation consultant uh, who has experience all around the country, we implemented our twice a week uh, watering schedule. This program was modeled on Dallas, Texas, where they have hotter summers than us and they get less rainfall than us. And they have a twice a week watering schedule that they enforce throughout their system. So that's what we did. And we are rolling this program out. The entire Greater Bridgeport system will be covered eventually. I think that's still going to take about two years to get there. And then some other systems where we see this uh, summertime peaking get sort of what I'll call out of control, um, sort of way above normal usage, uh, we've implemented the system. So that's the Granby, Sis Granby and Simsbury area up in the north in green and the Groton Stonington area all the way across the state. And we know it works. We know it works because we can see a reduction in demand. On this table, you can see the average Southwest Fairfield County demand in kind of the middle there where it says 35.8 in the top row. So that is the six years prior to the drought of 2016. The average day in the summertime, that May through October window, was 35.08 million gallons a day. In 2016, we had that drought year. 
We didn't implement water restrictions until October. We've since amended our water supply plan to allow us to do that sooner. But at the time, that was what our plan said that we had to do. So that was 35.7 million gallons a day. And in every single year since we have implemented that twice weekly watering schedule, you see less water in the uh, average day. And you can compare the rainfall. Of course, like this year, I'm, I'm a little nervous to put, to put the statistics on this year. It's going to look like we saved a lot of water when really it just rained a lot. Uh, but we use this as a tool to help us understand that this program is working. We can also see it on the next graph where the left-hand uh, sure. side of the graph is the years prior to implementation of the schedule and the right-hand side is the years after implementation of the schedule. You can clearly see the bars on the right-hand side are lower than those on the left. And you can see it in the days of the week on, on the next uh, bar graph with the blue and the green. So here, we have looked at consumption, or actually, I apologize, production. That's the only way we can do daily, is to look at production every single day of the week for this period. So where you see the red circles, that is Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So that is before we implemented the schedule. And everybody in town had their irrigation system set at Monday, Wednesday, Friday, because that's how the irrigation contractors did it. So we implemented our schedule, and now when we look at our production data, for the days of the week, you see the green circle bars are the days when uh, the schedule says you should be watering. So I can never remember even odd, but one day you should be watering one side of the street should be watering Tuesday, Saturday, and the other side should be watering Wednesday, Sunday. So do we have perfect compliance with this program? No, we don't. Uh, but we do see the shifts in our demand patterns. And the other thing that is fantastic about this is that demands influence pressure. So if you've ever heard from a constituent or a customer that they have low pressure or they have bad pressure or it's only on some days or it's only in the summer, that has to do with peak demands. Uh, so in splitting up the um, irrigation systems to these four days a week and even on side of the street, we reduce uh, the demand on every single day. So uh, just sort of wrapping up um, on the conservation program, we want to provide as much water as people need for their consumptive use, for hygiene, and most importantly, to ensure that there's an adequate amount of storage in our system's storage tanks so that if the fire department opens a hydrant, that there's adequate water there for the fire department. So it's another uh, driver and uh, another benefit of our conservation program is that we do not see our tanks drafting and refilling uh, to such an extreme extent as they did prior to the implementation of the program. So I said it was going fast, <laughs> uh, and I, I am. Uh, this is just a map of the distribution system in Fairfield. All the way in the top, you see two sort of blue cylinders there, uh, the Hemlocks tank, uh, adjacent to the surface water treatment plant where the water gets treated and then a very large water main bringing water down um, and feeding the distribution system. I am not the, the person to answer detailed questions about your distribution system, but I can, I can get answers back to anyone if you have questions about that. Uh, there are a lot of infrastructure improvements planned and budgeted for the Fairfield system, uh, many of them are listed here. Uh, I was in our engineering department for about 15 years of my career here at the water company. I will tell you when the plants um, turn 20, they have a capital improvement plan written and we start looking at what in particular your Hemlocks water treatment plant needs to ensure as it ages uh, that we're not losing uh, there's plenty of capacity at that plant, but we're not losing uh, electrical efficiency and we uh, have chemical treatment systems and pumps and things are operating in a good and reliable condition. Uh, so you see lots of, uh, lots of work planned to support the Fairfield system. And I think I'm done. All right, very good, thank you. <laughs> I would be happy to answer any questions. And again, if I can't, if I don't know the answer uh, to your question, I can. Um, Do you want to um, stop sharing your screen and uh, let's see, stop.
There we go. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I appreciate that. I'm going to open it up to the board for any questions. Sure, go ahead. Uh, thank you for that. There you are. You're welcome. Um, thank you for that presentation. Um, your last slide where it says, we never know the worth of water until the well is dry or the toilets don't flush, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, we have John Bodie's team in the room, so that's for them. Um, do you have any data on, and that was very thorough, and thank you, and I read through it. Um, I'm just curious, the waiver for people growing food, um, I know that was an issue where people could call and, and get exemptions for the schedule. Yeah. I'm just curious if people took advantage of that, and it's more just interest than anything. Yeah. Um, so we do have a waiver program for our, our irrigation schedule. So very large properties, um, high efficiency systems, and um, new plantings. So just to uh, the new plantings, we only allow in the spring and the fall, right? We want to encourage people to do what makes sense, right? If you're going to put new grass in, in July, that just, I'm sorry, it doesn't make sense. Um, you should be doing that in the spring or in the fall. Otherwise, you have to use obscene amounts of water and, and your grass may fail anyway. So that's that. The high efficiency uh, is basically just using a weather-based controller, um, having a system that is maintained and inspected and has a weather-based controller, and then uh, large properties. So specifically growing food, um, I had not heard that question before, and it's a very good one. Um, I suspect they would fall in to the large property kind of variance category, although um, that could be an assumption. Um, I do hope to sort of revamp the variance program a little bit um, before the next irrigation season rolls out. So that is something that we can um, find yeah, a way just, to make I that. Just, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm just saying it might be an interesting... Um, relationship or an, uh, an incentive or something for, for residents to think about. Um, yeah. And then with regards to the large properties, do we have any people who live here who kind of operate as their own independent water system? Like, because their property is big enough that they're using so much water that they kind of function as their own little entity. Is that a thing that exists here? Um. The, the only example I can think of would be golf courses. Golf courses often are our customer only for their clubhouse and restaurant. And they have irrigation uh, ponds or wells. So we get a lot of phone calls, people complaining about the golf course isn't following the rules. And we have to explain that the golf course isn't using our water to irrigate their grass. Um, so that's the only example I can think of. Um, off the top of my head, I'm not aware of other examples. Okay. That's it, but thank you for the presentation. You're very welcome. Yeah, thank you, Carolyn. It was a good presentation. A couple of questions for you that came up, and forgive me if I missed it. So you said at one point that water company came off of revenues being based on consumption. Is that correct? Yeah. So, so how do our residents get charged now? What's the basis for their charge? Yeah, so there still is a, um, a consumptive piece of your bill. So That's there are parts yeah. of yeah, there are parts of your bill that are fees, basically, yeah. for having this service available to you, whether you turn the water on or off or not, you're going to yeah. pay those fees. And then there is a consumptive part, but there's uh, something that is called a revenue adjustment mechanism. And we file um, our um, financial statements every six months with our regulator to demonstrate whether the revenue we brought in has met our revenue requirement. And if it hasn't, we put an adjustment on the next bill to right. capture the revenue that we did not earn because we didn't sell enough water. And if we have earned too much money, we put that money back as a credit on the next bill. So that happens twice a year. I'm guilty of not looking at my water bill. I don't water my grass. My bill's between like $40 and $50 a month, and I don't look at it. But twice a year, you will see a revenue adjustment, um, like a little notice in the footnote that this line has been adjusted and approved by uh, the Public Utility Regulatory Authority to correct that uh, imbalance. So thank you for that. And so that means basically you turned kind of a variable a variable revenue stream into more of a fixed revenue stream. 
in that regard. It's a better business model for you guys and yep. it allows you to do your conservation efforts. I get it. Um, as it relates to what was interesting, the presentation, like I said, was good. It didn't have much on just the town of Fairfield. Right. It really would be interesting to know more about the town of Fairfield. And one thing that was interesting in the presentation was it was something the numbers struck out at me. It was stuck out to me. It was something like over 90% of the customers are residential. We'd really be interested to know, you know, that's just, I'm assuming, number of customers, right? It's not the consumption. It would really be interesting to know what the consumption mix was between yep. res residential and commercial. Yeah, I do know that off the top of my head. So residential consumption accounts for about 70%. Of consumption. Okay. So this ten percent of commercial and industrial accounts are using thirty percent of the water. Uh, which isn't as bad as I actually thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be more. It yeah. would be interesting to get this information f for the town of Fairfield and us to understand whether we're in compliance and actually what um, what that ratio is for just the town of Fairfield. Yeah. You know. I'm sure I can get that. No, that was great. Thank you for that. You're very welcome. Um, is there any comments or questions from members of the public uh, regarding the presentation? Seeing none. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for taking the time and um, keep up the good work. Thank you so much. Say hi to George. <laughs> Will do. <laughs> Very good. Take care. Bye bye. Okay. Our next item is um, item number five uh, in a motion to hear and consider an act upon the following resolution. Anybody want to wear it? I'll um, move to waive the reading of five. And so are we taking it up as two separate? Well, there are two uh, separate votes. Okay. okay. Uh, so I'll I'll move to waive the reading of item number five. Okay. I, I'm fine with no reading. I think you do have to explain. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All in favor of waiving the uh, reading of the minutes? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Um. So uh, the reading of the agenda. Yes. I mean of the agenda item. Um. Hi, Jared. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Um. So this item. Um. Is regarding the uh, it's this is RTM approved three hundred thousand for the design of the Fairfield Beach Station, uh, which you remember um, back on in twenty twenty two, and so on October twenty fourth we the RTM also approved three hundred thousand for the Center Street Pump Station, and on October twenty fourth twenty twenty two they uh, also approved three hundred thousand for the South Pine Creek Pump Station, and so. Um, Jared, you're going to talk a little bit about this? Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of writing there, but it's pretty, yeah. pretty straightforward. Yeah. Um, we're taking upstate design projects and combine them into a single project for the ones that, that Brenda just mentioned, Street, Pine Creek, and Fairfield Beach. So $300,000 each um, being combined. $900,000 total. And then the second piece of this is uh, an additional authorization of $336,000. This is to be in compliance with uh, the State uh, Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, their uh, quality based selection program with regard to selecting a consultant. Um, we have targeted these projects for, uh, potentially for grants. And so in order to be eligible for the grants, we need to be in compliance with this, uh, with this program, QBS program. And so that's uh, the total amount, the total of this authorization given the previously authorized 300,000 for each of those, plus the additional 336 um, would be one twenty two three fifth. Thanks, Sharon. I'll open it up to the board. I don't have any questions um, except to ask um, Christine, who's in the room, if you have anything to add. Um, Christine is 
public is kind of running point on this and you are an amazing asset. And I'm quoting that from both the chair and the vice chair of WPCA who thank you and John Bodie, who is clapping next to you. So I just want to say that out loud. Thank you for managing this and helping us get through. Do you have anything to add to that that would be helpful for the public or is that sort of Sort of the gist of it, unless somebody has a specific question. Yeah. Their questions. So, Jared, thank you. So, Jared, <laughs> three of these have already been authorized. So, this is just basically an authorization to combine them. Combine them and then add the 336. Right. Now, now the, the three, piece. the 336, that is additional and it's for two reasons, right? The, Quick question is the QBS program. What does that do? It's the, thank you. It's how the consultants are selected. We select consultants. There's different ways of cons uh, selecting them. We um, sent out requests for qualifications for several consultants, and then we interviewed them and went through a whole process of selecting the most qualified consultant. And then you ask for a cost proposal, and then you negotiate that cost proposal. And that's how you get them on board. Sometimes you do that, you base it on the lowest price or, um, yeah. So the Connecticut Deep requires us to use this quality-based selection. So sometimes you have to pay a little bit more for the design based on the qualifications of the candidate. Okay, so for $900,000 worth of projects, we're paying an additional $336,000. Yeah, the 900 was an estimate that we had come up with last year, 2022. Yeah, but this 336 is in addition to that. Yes. And just related to, as you just said, part of this design and vetting, vetting the, the consultants, right? And two questions. Number one, we're spending the 336 in the hope, and I say hope, that's not your word, right? Of getting reimbursed from the state, or will we definitely get reimbursed from the state? Yes, we're going to submit this proposal yeah. and this this um, cost proposal and the scope of services to Connecticut Deep. Yeah. And they will evaluate and let us know that they agree with it or not and tell us that we're eligible for reimbursement. If they don't agree with it, we're not going forward with this award of this contract. Right. So there's no risk that we're going to be out there at 336. We should get how much back if they approve it? Well, total, it's $1.2 million for the design of the three. Right. And we would get the, all of it back. Or how much, what percentage of it we, we get back? I don't know yet which percentage we would get. Okay. I guess what I'm asking is, if we spend 336 so that this is eligible for reimbursement from the state, the least I want to get back is 336. The, the, the 336 is, I don't know what you mean by the 336. It's Yeah, we're, we're not paying 336 yeah. just to, to, to get approval. The 336 is in addition to the 900 for the whole... Oh. Package of design. So the three hundreds were not enough to cover. Correct. Right. Because the way this reads and the way it was discussed was we've had nine hundred thousand dollars out there, right? And then we're adding this three thirty six to be part of this program. But what you're actually saying is the nine hundred wasn't enough, so we had to put more out there and then be part of the program. So how much more we have to put out? over the 900, not to be part of the program, but just to go out. Well, we haven't put out anything yet. We I understand that. 900,000, it's actually 1.2 million that it's going to cost to design all three of these. Okay. So it's an additional 336 that we are asking for approval for. <laughs> I understand that. No, that, that part's clear. Okay. What I'm saying is I'm hearing two different answers on the 336. The first answer I'm hearing is, Oh, by the way, we need to spend the 336 to be part of this state program. Okay. The design, the design proposal from the engineer is 1.234 million. Okay. So in order to design it the proper way, we need to spend that much money because there's soil borings, there's flood investigations, investigations permitting, all that kind of stuff. So when we when the commission said, okay, it's going to cost 300000 that's what we thought it was last year. It's indeed $1.234 million. So it went up by 25% or 33%. The $300,000 that we estimated last year was a, a wild guess. So the entire town, so that went through and got approved. I'm sure you didn't come here and say it was based on a wild guess, though. Well, at the time, we said 
how much do you think it'll cost to do this? And at the time, that's what they said. So we were off by 33%. It, 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 was, it, was, based on East it was kind of based on Easton Turnpike, and then you throw into the flood zones with uh, especially Fairfield Beach and Pine Creek, and even Pine uh, Center Street, Pine Creek. All three of them are in a flood zone, and each right. have their own yeah, parameters that would have to be investigated and have to be researched. So that's why the cost went up. So this is just the design, though? Just the design. What was the total project estimated at that's in your capital plans going forward, your models going forward? Total of all three of these? Yeah. Um, I'd have to go back and look at it, but it's probably in the, the, the capital uh, 15 to 20 million. So are we talking that this could be up to 25 million? I mean, if we're off 25, 30% here, are we off that amount on the overall project? Yeah, I, I wouldn't make the assumption that the design. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure it out. Design would frankly to like being off by that much in construction. Do we have a better estimate on construction now? Or no? Yeah, no. Where is this? This is an additional 336, Jared. I'm assuming this 336 wasn't in the original plan, right? From the 2016, the 2018 plan. I'm assuming the, the additional 336 was not in the original capital plan for this item. That was not, no. So this is an addition to anything that we planned. So this has to come from somewhere else in order to pay for this, right? No, none of this is coming out of uh, capital is being borrowed. This is all coming from fund balance. From all coming from WCPA. fund balance from WCPA, right. WPCA, so additional amount. Even the additional amount. So where is that going to leave us with the fund balance there? Right now it's at uh, uh, 13 million. So this is going to drain it down. It's been at 13 million for a while, but we keep approving projects. So if what's the unallocated portion of the 13 million? Um, that that's where it stands as of today. That's what the that's the unallocated action. Yeah. It seems to me every time I ask, it's at thirteen million, and then we vote a million out, and it continues to stay at thirteen million. Am that's I just wrong? Flu it's a fluctuation of because we're looking at how much we have in the account at that time, and, mm -hmm. and it's going to fluctuate with you know uh, collections that come in. And yeah, can you do me a favor and just send me and send me the brief? You don't have to do an analysis or anything. Just show me the, the flow of funds on that, if you wouldn't mind, including the the allocation, the allocated portions. Yeah. I'm just concerned because it keeps on, the same number keeps coming up. Yeah, it could be my memory. But no, I think you're right. I think it is has been around there. Yeah. So I'd just like to see how that's going because you know I've expressed concern before that we're, we've got a huge nut coming up for WPC and we keep on spending it down. And being out by 336 which was an estimate that was provided last year. The 900 was provided last year at least to the town bodies. And now we're coming back and it's this amount off. Yeah, we, we got we got an estimate from, from our engineer saying how much would it cost to design them to guess 300 for each. We went with it. And now that we have an engineer looking at everything, we're at the one, two, three, four. So when will we have numbers on what going forward will cost here because these are projects that need to be done i we're we're at the 1.234 is not to exceed no i understand that what would it cost for the next phase of it to actually this is the design part oh construction when do we when do we when do we anticipate we'll get those numbers we'll be doing it once the project gets awarded there'll be about uh six months of field investigation doing soil borings and analysis and um doing structural analysis of the and then there will be a design report, a preliminary design report. So in approximately six months, we should have a preliminary design report with like an approach, the design approach, which could give us a cost of that construction. Got it. And just one last point, one last clarity. When the 300000 or the 900000 was approved as we went through, right, um, did we assume we would have to do the borings and all this? This was an additional work, was it? Yes. The, originally, we weren't aware that uh, locations such as like Fairfield Beach, we might we might need to elevate that structure based on the flood requirements with FEMA and stuff, which I don't believe was, I wasn't um, with the town at that time, but I don't believe that that was factored in. That kind of construction. Do we have an estimate on that? No, not yet. So we're looking at not only the 15 to 20 million, we're looking at a cost of raising something too, right? 
Potentially, yes. And these are all discussed at the meeting, right? These exactly. items are discussed at length at the WPCA meetings? Yes. And then this would be um, requesting um, potentially um, applying for a clean water funding. Uh -huh. if we bundle them together as the construction projects. We might be able to get more monies from DEEP. It's all uh, being constant. Get deep. So are you doing all the work related to applying for all these? I'm working with engineering. Yeah, and you're filling out all the forms? Yeah, the consultant would be assisting us with that so that we can do it correctly. Uh, that's what I was <laughs> Yeah, this sounds scary. And these projects need to move forward. You're comfortable with the 1.2, whatever we're talking here, that this is the end of this phase. Then we're going into water or something, what it's right. going to cost. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any comment from the public? Seeing none, back to the board. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. All right, the second item is, um, I'll, I'll move to waive the reading. It's really, okay, it's not that bad. Um, so it's, uh, can I get a motion to hear and consider an act upon the following resolution resolved in the importance with the representation from the WPCA, so the set length, funding up, up to 235000 from the WPCA fund balance for quality-based selection, OBS, of the design consultant for Toll House, Mill River, Eastfield, and Willow Street Pump Stations at Forest Maintenance Investigation Phase 2 be hereby approved. Uh, so moved. Second. Okay, this, this is for the remaining four pump stations that are not on phase one. Um, this would be work to um, look at structures, look at force mains, look at easements, hazardous material, hydraulic analysis, future flows, just investigative work. So when we go to design these, we'll have the information available. This is information that doesn't get old, doesn't go by the wayside. Um, this is a, a good number we got from the engineer that we selected for phase one. This is work that they could do if approved in between waiting for other stuff for the phase one stuff. Thank you, John. Open up to the board for questions. Is there a um, contract associated with this? Okay. That will come before us. Yep. That's what I was asking. We need a diagram for just what the phasing actually is. Phase one, phase two. It's <laughs> phase one, three, and phase two is the remaining four. It's critical. Yeah, less critical, right? And these are behind the ones we just went through. Is that what we're saying? This is the information we have on these sports mains and these structures are from 2016, 17, 18. This would be advancing that information, that field information, so we'd be in a better place to estimate the construction costs going forward. We haven't had any of the nasty surprises that we had on this one. No, yeah, this is just, this would be to do the field investigation and the preliminary design, so we understand the design approach and a probable cost for um, construction. This is again coming out of the fund balance that we just talked about, right. that 13 million that stays at 13 million. I need, I need a fund like that. So, yeah. And I remind the public, this is one of those things, like it's all well and good when it's not a problem. And when it's a problem, it's really a problem. So, um, <laughs> you know, it sounds expensive and it is expensive, but these are the things that we have to do to invest in the infrastructure so that doesn't. All right, thank you. Is there any comment from the public on this item? Seeing none, back to the board. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you both very much. Um, okay. Uh, just for information purposes, uh, Brian McCann of our uh, Conservation Commission um, uh, resigned. His term was going to be up soon, but he needed to um, step back. So I just wanted to publicly thank him for serving. Um, he did serve for a long time on the commission, and um, I really appreciate his uh, hard work and, and effort. 
And um, the other one, uh, next item, item number eight, is just um, conservation commission appointments are for select person uh, only. So I just wanted to announce uh, to the board and to the public that uh, it was the um, recommendation of the chair to appoint Catherine uh, O'Mahoney of Mill River Road, uh, and her term will uh, expire 11 uh, 2024. And she's going to move from alternate to full member to replace Brian. Um, so I just wanted to. Oh, Mahoney, a nice Italian lady. That's a very Italian lady, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> it couldn't be any more person. Sure. <laughs> and and uh, P I see a, one of our conservation members, Peter Hood, there, um, who is an awesome member. And um, you're, happy, you're getting a, a new alternate. Peter was an alternate for a while, a long time, too, and now is a full member. So I, I know that, uh, that Catherine will be. Uh, Welcome addition to the board. Is that you? Oh, no, that's our internet. <laughs> okay, our next item is um, just to say thank you, you know, to Brian, Brian yep. his work, and to Catherine, obviously somebody who was selected by the body, the commission. So good luck to her. And, and she's been an alternate, so she's yeah. up to speed on about how things work, so that's really good. It's a really good commission. All right. Um, nine, uh, we do have an executive session. I just want to make note of that. And uh, nine is to hear and consider any act uh, other business that shall come before the meeting. I do want to just remind people that we, um, I held a, a press conference with the Ukraine Steering Committee, um, it was last week. Um, I put it in the newsletter on Friday. Uh, so we sort of officially kicked off our uh, event that's coming up in October. And uh, it was a very emotional press conference. Um, it's, uh, one of our members, who Yulia, who grew up in Ukraine and lives in the United States um, for many years, but, you know, really shared her tremendous pain of what her, what, her, what her people and her family and members of the people she cares about are going through it. So I hope uh, our community will reach out. I mean, it was made a point like $25 a person, we'd raise over a million, even if just everyone gave $2 before to reach our goal. So it's such a small amount to, to give to a country fighting for democracy. And I, I feel very strongly um, about this. And I, you know, I mentioned at the press conference that if we were in that kind of position, we would hope that others would reach out to help us. Um, and so I, I hope by calling our community to step up and, and try to help um, a country fighting for their independence. Um, so open it up. Does anybody have anything? Sure. Yeah, I was reading in the press and following the whole um, redistricting discussion to the Board of Ed. And they now have to go back to the state and ask for more time and what have you. They've reached out for any assistance from the town as it relates to talking with the state or legal requirements or anything like that. No, I mean, I've always had discussions with the superintendent, but um, that's solely their purview. Yeah. Not the towns. Um, I think they made the right decision in, in postponing. Um, I don't think the facilities, um, first of all, I, I don't believe we should redistrict based on race. I think it should be on space. And I think that the facilities committee that I used to chair when I was on the board of education, you know, needs to do some work on, to their own point. They don't have enough space and, and all the special programming that goes on in the schools and stuff. And they were like kind of all over the place. They were closing Dwight, then they weren't closing Dwight, then they were doing something to Jennings, and they weren't doing something to Jennings. So there was a lot of confusion, and you know the community was obviously we all were aware that they were you know kind of you know upset, and, and uh, redistricting conversations are always upsetting. But um, I'm I'm glad that they're going to pull back. They're going to look at their facilities. They're going to hopefully come to our capital uh, workshops and have discussions. I believe. Uh, uh, superintendent shared with me that that's going to be the premise of their discussion with the state, that they're not prepared because they would have to literally, they don't have the space to redistrict in a way that would give the state satisfy their antiquated 1968 law. But nonetheless, um, they need to review their space uh, issues and they need to put together a plan and come 
to our capital planning meetings that we have and I guess, you know, move around their deck chairs to figure out how, what they're going to do next. And I guess Mike's going to go and talk to the state about that process and hopefully they'll understand that we're not in a position that would make no sense to redistrict children now and then do it again in two years, or, you know, three years. So, so I, first of all, I agree with your commentary. Second of all, the reason I asked the question is when I was on the board of finance, we actually, when this discussion, one of the times it came up, we actually told the board that if they were going to fight the redistricting with the state, come back to us and tell us what that looks like and maybe we would work with them. And certainly if it's to your point, uh, first like woman, you know, in 1960s law, if there's efforts underway to revise that law, join that before, as you said, about the redistricting itself. I did note with great interest the comments related to facilities. I don't have the details in front of me, so I would love to understand what the enrollment levels are now because the enrollment levels would have had a changed two things that drive that space issue, space issue. Number one, enrollment levels going way back to where they were several years ago because we used to have over a little over 10,000 students. I think it was 10,400 in the district, and we were down to something like 8,500. So that's number one. And number two, like anything, sometimes programs and utilization expands to take up available space. And I don't know whether we have an issue with that. Not my purview. I don't sit on the Board of Ed. But it was just when I heard that was one of the reasons that, that triggered that thought in my mind is what's driving that. But um, if they're going to fight it um, or if the state's not going to work with them and they need help, I think they should come and ask for it. That's what I'd say. Well, I'm always supportive of, of anything that okay. they want to do, and especially that issue, which I, you know, introduced a sure. list of legislation literally every year I was in the legislature just to have a study group to look at the law to see if it needed updated with stakeholders. Um, but I was, you know, denied that opportunity. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, look, but McKinley is a gem, right? And the, the, uh, how long have, has this been out there where people don't want to, leave that school and if you go to that school you go to an event to the school what you know one of its um strengths is its diversity and it's and it's, well listen i think it's a complicated issue but just in terms of what the town of fairfield has to do you know uh, the superintendent has to make a case yeah. uh to the state board of education that the town of fairfield is not prepared to do this and show the, all the scenarios that they ran through that don't give them the number that the state requires and that they need more time to assess their facilities and a more time to figure out how to do under this law. Now, if any of our legislators want to take up that mantle in the next legislative session, God bless them. I support them 100%. Amen. Um, and that would be lovely. Uh, so... <laughs> I'm just glad that, that, you know, there was a lot of people reaching out to me, asking me to, to intervene in the redistricting process. And I tried to be um, as clear as possible in my newsletter and in my conversations with residents that it's not my purview uh, to re be involved in redistricting. Um, I didn't like it when I was on the Board of Ed, when the first select person used to sort of come and make comments when they didn't have a full vote in that matter. So, um you know, I have my opinions, but I don't have the authority. The Board of Ed is the statutory uh, authority. So, listen, I think it's the right decision. And, and listen, there, uh, town will always be very supportive of the school district and the superintendent, uh, whatever he needs to do. And um, if he needs me to go up there and speak on behalf, um, I'd be happy to do that or send a letter with me. Thank you. Um, I think the redistrict, redistricting... That's a hard one. Redistricting <laughs> conversation is a really hard one. It's a complicated one, but I can't help feeling frustrated because I remember the conversations around Mill Hill, Tom, mm -hmm. and the conversations about size and making it a 504. And I know, um, at the, I mean, again, it's, 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 couple history, of let me just finish my yeah. thought here. It's, it's now hindsight. It's in the rear view. We can't do anything about it. There is a beautiful building there. It's smaller than I would have liked. It's smaller than what I voted for. Um, so that piece is fr frustrating. So it, it's just, to me, it's just sitting a little bit like, okay, we want to help. We want to help. There was something so tangible that we could have done collectively. 
Um, and I hope that, um, Brenda, you will help if it is asked for. And I hear you and I hear you're saying it and, and take you at that. And if the Board of Ed, I don't know if anyone is on, um, is listening, I hope that they will call on you to do whatever is in your purview to, to help because it is such a complicated issue. And I know parents are feeling really emotional about it. And I don't have kids in the school district, but I hear what people are saying and and how emotional it is for people and just the reality of what it is. So glad I'm not in the position to have to vote on it personally, but I, I do know that um, it's impacting a lot of, it's impacting us all as a community. So I just wanted to say that, like, I, I'm hearing you, I know, but I'm also remembering the conversations around Mill Hill well, specifically being. Two things. Yeah. Show me the facts that show that we don't have enough space because that's a hell of a lot of student growth in a couple of years, this, which was way beyond projections. Yeah. The second thing was, as it relates to Mill Hill, the police department wouldn't necessarily sign off on it because of the traffic concerns over there, nor would the neighborhood. I don't remember. Because yeah. I had a lot yeah, of discussions with the police chief at that time regarding it. So it's as to your point, it's water under the dam, right? What I'm more interested in is if we're going to actually fight this time, as the first select woman said, and review a 50 to 60 year old law, law that seems significantly out of place. Well, I don't know that the, the school district and, you know, just to be really clear, you know, I'm very familiar with this issue, having served on the board and in the legislature. I think what Mr. Tist the superintendent Destani is going to do is ask for additional time Agreed. due to the circumstances. Now, during that period of time, Yes. Could the legislature take this up and have a look-see at it? Um, I think they should. Um, anything that's that old should obviously be reviewed and looked at because, you know, it's old. And anyway, um, but just like you know, one step be. at a time. Exactly. I was just going to say. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, I just am glad because I really felt for our, our community, especially our parents, um, you know, they just really, they were out, they were so twisted up. And I get it. Um, and so I'm glad that they're they're going to get a breath, gonna take a deep breath, and they have, they're not going to have to talk about redistricting for a little while. And I have full confidence um, in our superintendent and the board, and I hope our state delegation will try to champion uh, taking a look at this thing in the next legislative session, and I guess stay tuned. Yeah, and I mean, just opportunities like plan of conservation and development, all the things that are tangential and adjacent to all of this, it, it goes together, I mean, holistically. So I just think there are lots of opportunities and ways which we can all collectively be a part of a solution. So it won't be me because I won't be serving, but I will be there on the sidelines advocating. So. Right. Well, if there's no other business. There is one thing, the spotted lantern bugs. Uh -huh. um, I was... <laughs> I know I don't know if everybody is aware of what's happening, but they're an invasive <laughs> they're an invasive species. And it was like a friend of mine was at South Pine Creek Beach and said like it looked like the ground was moving from so I don't know what the town or if the town or what the state or what we should do, but it seems like there's just been a huge infestation. Yes. And and, and again, it's, it's, is what should we do? What so the bottom line is says that the state, which I don't find it a little weird but um and i told our conservation director that but their their protocol is to you know kill them and then report it which i'm not sure why we need to report it because they're everywhere so right. we know they're there why people are taking the time to report something i mean i i killed a lot over the weekend i South didn't report it to anybody reported. Um, moving. But the bottom line is, I don't know. I, I, I'm assuming I've asked our conservation director to reach out to the state DEP to ask if they have some long-term uh, a solution to this problem that doesn't include like the residents of the state of Connecticut killing bugs every day. Or some gross um, chemical. So I don't know what, you know, I'm, but I'm assuming we're going to figure something out because this can't be the solution. Yeah, yeah. If you, because they're really everywhere. And, um, you know, I, I would hope there was a more technical response to this thing yeah. than kill and call. So, if, so yeah, if you could just let us know um, as a community, because people are starting to. Soon as, but if I know whatever, I, whatever I, for, I have, I send out that newsletter. If I have an update from DEP, believe you me. But I've asked Tim to ask them: Is you know, are they 
are they meeting to discuss a long range plan? Are they, what's the plan? Because this cannot be the long range plan. And they're not harmful to people. They're just invasive to, which, I mean, I guess globally they are. No, they're very dark. It's invasive. The environment. It's bad for the environment. So I you know, don't understand that. It's crazy how they multiply. They don't sting you. It's not yeah. that. So I just want people to know, like, yes, no, I have killed them because they're invasive. People are reporting it to poor Tim Bishop. <laughs> box full of that. I killed a black span lander fly today okay i mean i don't you know it really what you what do you do with that information and i can't believe dep is made you know saying that this is the protocol like they should step it up and i don't know send out a crew of lantern but in the my killers or something i don't know <laughs> there's a lot of them around but for the real animal lovers, you got to kill them because they're invasive. I know. They're I know. Insects. They're invasive. Um, I mean, I don't like killing anything, and I don't ever kill anything, but it's amazing how your my psyche, do you know, if I, this weekend was the first time I actually saw one. And I immediately, like, stepped on it. Like, I didn't even think. And I'm like, it's one of those, and I killed it. And then I think all of us are like, <laughs> Which is sad that we have to do that, but I mean, it's an invasive uh, species and that's what the protocol is. So I will definitely keep the, the town uh, updated if I get new information from DEP, but that's pretty much where we are. Kill and report. I personally think you should just kill and move on. Or exterminate. Let's say exterminate. <laughs> okay. Wow, what a great way to end the meeting. No, thanks. <laughs> Oh, thanks, Nance. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm making a motion to uh, go into executive session. Moved. Second it. All in favor. Aye. Aye.